Welcome to our review on biotic and abiotic factors. So when we're actually considering an ecosystem and the factors that can affect it, we can divide them up into two groups. First one being the biotic factors, second one abiotic factors. So if we think about our biotic factors, first of all, these are the living factors. Just like biology is the study of living things, biotic has the same start there, BIO, so it's living factors. Now, these could include anything along the lines of the number of organisms that are present, what actual organisms they are, and also the competition between them. So it's all to do with the living factors and how they all interact with each other. So competition is kind of your go-to answer for this. If you're asked for an example of a biotic factor, competition, dead easy one to put in. Now, one way you can help yourself to remember the biotic one is when you use the word, just draw a little picture that reminds you of what it actually is. So you can see on the word biotic there, I've just added various living organisms, just as that reminder, this is a living factor. The second factor are the abiotic factors. Now that letter A in front tells us that it's not in science. So this means not living factors. These are the physical factors. So this would be things like the temperature, the pH, etc. And you can see at the bottom again, all I've done is I've used the word abiotic and then just included some little images and pictures that just hopefully trigger that idea about it being those physical factors. So the thermometers, the rain, etc. What we're going to do now then is have a little look at these abiotic factors in turn and see how they actually impact. So the first one is light intensity. Hopefully we remember from B1 that light is required for photosynthesis. Now, if we think logically, hopefully our brain tells us that the greater the amount of light available, the greater the success of the plant, because it will be able to carry out photosynthesis at a faster rate. What we actually find, though, is that it's not just the case that we only find plants growing where there's lots of light. You will find plants that grow in shady areas, but they've actually evolved in order to grow successfully in that lower light intensity. So what we tend to find is that those plants that are designed to grow in the shade actually have much larger surface areas on their leaves to allow them to trap the maximum amount of light that's present. Our second abiotic factor is temperature. Now, hopefully again, we remember from our earlier topics that temperature is a vital factor in affecting how enzymes actually work. And hopefully we do remember that enzymes are basically key in a huge number of metabolic reactions inside living things. So what we actually know is that if the temperature is changing, it's going to have an effect on the enzymes and therefore it's going to affect those metabolic reactions. So if we think about plants, first of all, if we've got nice warm temperatures, then that's going to actually aid the rapid development of plants because all of those metabolic reactions are happening faster because the enzymes are working faster. If we think about the animal kingdom, then we see a slightly different effect here because we've obviously got warm blooded and cold blooded animals. So the cold blooded ones are called ectotherms, warm blooded endotherms. Now, lizards here are a great example of ectotherms, so they're cold blooded. And in order to actually warm them up, then you'll notice if you ever go anywhere with lizards, first thing in the morning, they are all just lying around basking in the sun. And the whole purpose behind that is to actually absorb that warmth from the sun. And then that gives them the warmer temperature inside their body. Their enzymes will then start to speed up. Their metabolic reactions will then start to speed up. It's vitally important for the ectotherms, endotherms, not so much because warm blooded animals actually control their own body temperature. Therefore, we don't have to go and sit in the sun first thing in the morning to wake us up. Our third factor is moisture. Hopefully we do know that if you have a lack of water, then that can lead to death. Because what we actually know is that inside our body, our blood plasma's main component is water. So a lack of water will kill us. If we think about plants, they have a slightly different impact initially. So if there's a lack of water in plants, then they start to wilt. And you may have noticed this if you're about as good at keeping pot plants alive as I am, that when you don't water them for a good couple of weeks, then they just kind of flop very sadly over the edge of the pot. 
and the reason for that is that the cells are no longer turgid so that means that the cell walls are not being held rigid therefore the plant is drooping the final abiotic factor is the pH of the soil. Now soil pH is actually very important when we're looking at growing plants because it's going to affect two things. Firstly, the biological activity in the soil and secondly, the availability of the minerals. Now if you've ever tried to grow things in your garden, you may have noticed that some things grow really well where you live and others not so much. And that could very well be down to the pH of your soil, because what we find is certain plants are adapted to grow in either acid or alkali conditions. So good examples of plants for acid soils are rhododendrons and ferns, whereas alkaline plants are things like cucumber and cauliflower. There is one pretty special kind of plant, though, that is really common in people's gardens, which is one called a hydrangea, which you can see at the bottom. And the reason this is a special plant is because when you actually grow it in soils of different pHs, the colour of the flowers actually changes. So you can see that in the pH 4.5 there, so those acidic conditions, then it's a blue flower you get. Whereas if we're up at the pH 7, then it ends up as a deep pink colour flower. So the last thing we need to look at in this little review is how we'd actually measure these abiotic factors. And it's all using very simple bits of equipment. So if we wanted to measure the light intensity in an area, we would just use a light meter. And that's got the unit of measurement of lux. And you can see the light meter in the bottom left corner there. If we wanted to measure the moisture present, we use a humidity sensor and that's given as a percentage. And what you can see is a basic soil humidity sensor there. So that one is the one you can buy in most garden centers. Obviously, they come in slightly more complex versions as well, but it gives you an idea. pH is measured using a pH probe, which is on the right hand side there, as you can see. And hopefully you remember pH has no units, hence why it's blank on the right hand side of the table. And then finally, if we want to measure the temperature, the good old thermometer comes into play. And remember, when we're talking about science, we measure in degrees Celsius. So hopefully by now you've got a good understanding of what biotic and abiotic factors are and how those four key abiotic factors will affect the growth or survival of different organisms.